the miracle of Israel, living proof of a living God. Tonight we will be using extensively our Bibles, so if you have one, please make use of it as we look through the quotes. Many of them I'll have up on the screen for your advantage so that we can find them quickly, but there will be some whereby we use our Bibles for references, especially when we come back to our reading of Isaiah 43 later on tonight. Well, the first Prime Minister of the newly created nation of Israel made this statement. He said, in Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel, in an interview in 1956, eight years after Israel had become a nation, the new nation of Israel. And at first glance, you would have to see this statement as a contradiction. Because if you're a realist, you don't believe in miracles. And so what David Ben-Gurion was really doing here was he was challenging people's thoughts because what he was saying was, the reality is Israel, being a nation, is a, is a miracle. It is, in fact, the miracle that God has predicted, prophesied and made happen, fulfilled right before the nations of this world's eyes. David Ben-Gurion had seen the miracle of Israel become a nation. The people of the land of Israel, the Jews, from all over the earth coming together and becoming part of that nation that we know today. It was a real thing that he'd witnessed. It's something that had not been done before in history and it's something that has not been done since either. No other nation has gone out of existence for around 2,000 years and then come back into existence again. Israel's existence today is nothing short of a miracle and we're going to have a look at that a little bit deeper tonight. But why are we so interested as Bible students? Why are we so interested in this nation? Why do we believe that they are proof for, for us of a living God? And the reason for that, the answer for that, lies in this book that we have here today, tonight, the Bible, which we're going to use for our answers. Because the Bible is a book that is based on, and in fact it, it hinges on really, the nation of Israel as a people. And not just about Israel, but it's the reason for their existence, the existence that goes right back to the beginning. And it's all about their future as well, about the future of Israel that goes past the future of the rest of the world's nations. There is no other nation that has a future depicted in Scripture like Israel's. And that makes Israel a very interesting subject for us. It's a challenging subject sometimes to understand, to understand how God works with his people. But I hope you're going to find out tonight through this subject, how interesting it is to see God's hand working in the world. So modern Israel was, as we said, officially formed in 1948 with the blessings of the United Nations Assembly. But Israel is actually one of the oldest nations in time, with history that scans, scans back some 5,000 years. And there's some amazing things that have happened since the Jews have moved into the land. Simple things like the Hebrew language being used again. It's heard in the streets. A language which really it's another miracle because some 200 years ago the Hebrew language was almost well, virtually lost and yet today it is used by Jews within their own land. So what are the events that brought them to this new nation? You know, when we look at all the countries around the world, we, we soon realise that there have been, in the last 75 years, quite a few new nations formed. I think there's uh, something like 150 new countries, which is quite amazing, isn't it? But Israel is the only nation out of all those that has been recreated from their previous existence. And not only that, they're living in their original homeland. That in itself is amazing, isn't it? Not just that they're, that they're back as a nation, but they're, they're in their original homeland that they occupied 2,000 years ago. In fact, what we find is that what happened here is precisely what Scripture tells us was to happen. And Bible students at the time rejoiced to see this fulfilled because they saw it very clearly as part of God's purpose, working in the world to bring it to a certain point in history. My question to you tonight is to you is, 
What will it take to convince you that Israel's existence is a miracle and absolute proof of God's existence? Well, I think we're going to be able to do that tonight if you have an open mind to the scriptures. And let's start by looking at the events that brought this new nation of Israel into existence in 1948. So history tells us pretty clearly that after the Second World War, the nationalist Jews were left without any hope. They had been persecuted, they'd been hounded to death. They were hunted from every place in Europe and they were often executed on the spot when they were found. Or else they were taken to concentration camps and worked until they starved to death. And at the end of World War II, the surviving Jews were displaced as well as homeless. Their properties had either been destroyed or confiscated. And now they were looking for somewhere to live, a place that they could belong to. And interestingly, it was the English who first championed this cause, this cause for the quest to find a home for the Jews, for this nation of Israel, a permanent home. And that started back before the Second World War, at the end of the First World War, actually, in 1917. There was a group of Jews that first formed the idea of having their own homeland. They were led by a man known as Lord Rothschild. And they campaigned under the banner of the Zionist movement. And after some deliberation and discussion within the British government, they issued a letter to Lord Rothschild declaring their support for this move to establish a land for Israel. And as it was signed by the British Foreign Secretary at the time, Arthur Balfour, this letter became known as the Balfour Declaration. And it's the letter we have here tonight, which gives us a bit of an idea of where uh, England was going with this. And you'll notice that it's uh, 1917 and addressed, as I said, to Lord Rothschild. Alpha, Arthur Jones Balfour says, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's Government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which have been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this objective, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Well, that was a landmark decision by the British. It was probably ahead of its time a bit because nothing would take place for some time yet. World events were to intervene with the Second World War. And it wasn't, as I said, till the end of the Second World War that the world finally faced this dilemma that the Jewish people had. Where would they live? What would they do? And so after a very historic UN vote, it was agreed that the Jews would finally form their own nation again in their former homeland. And so Israel was able to declare, with David Ben-Gurion as their first Prime Minister, they were able to declare their independence as a nation. And finally, the Jews around the world could celebrate that God had given them this opportunity. Well, as witnessed today in world events, you will know that the surrounding Arabs met this decision with absolute anger and with force. In fact, they collectively agreed to destroy Israel and remove the Jews once again from their land. And so before the nation of Israel had even got on its feet, before it had even started, hadn't even been born, they found themselves at war against a dozen neighbours. Not only had they struggled to survive the Second World War, lucky to be able to call themselves survivors, now they had to fight and they had to keep the land that they'd finally be given. And so immediately on the declaration of their independence, war broke out. And look at the amount of uh, pressure that they were under, this, this small nation in this small area of land, when suddenly they've got the Egyptian army down here attacking, the Jordanians, the Iraqis, the Syrians, the Lebanese, the Arabs. There was all these 
Palest- all these uh, Arab forces and their neighbours coming in on them. And all of a sudden, they found themselves under huge pressure to survive. I think you'd agree that under normal circumstances, the chances of survival were pretty slim. It was estimated that approximately 40 million Arabs joined together against the Jews. There was only just over half a million Jews in the land at the time. They say 600,000 Jews. The Arabs had all their professional armies, supposedly all well-trained with all the latest gear that they could buy. The Jews had to scramble around for whatever they could put together. They were untrained. As I said, they'd just come out of surviving the Second World War. Some of them lucky to even be alive. And suddenly they've got to learn to fight and be an army. And yet the world watched in amazement as the Jews won every battle that they fought. They were able to push back the oppressors. They actually gained land. They overcame their oppositions. The Arabs were put to rout. And incredibly, a miracle occurred. The miracle of the land of Israel in which the nation was established. And look at this. The world itself saw how the Arabs were determined to push the Jews into the sea. They would do anything they could to destroy them. The world mocked it. They laughed at it. And they thought the Jews had no chance. And yet finally that day came when only a miracle against all odds allowed Israel to come out and be a stronger nation. No other nation has started their birth under such pressure. And how they survived is an amazing story to read in the history books today. But that was just the beginning. More trouble was yet to come. In 1956, there was the Suez Crisis, when the Egyptians blocked the Suez Canal from anybody who wanted to take anything through there for Israel, resulting in Israel taking them on. It was a big challenge and it brought the the world to its knees in some ways with its trading powers. In 1967, the Arabs launched the Six-Day War against Israel. Again, there was another war, within 20 years of them being formed. And then shortly thereafter, six years later, in 1973, there was the Yom Kippur War when it was launched on the Israeli Holy Day when it was thought that Israel would not fight back so it would give them an op- an, an, a chance to defeat them. I think you agree that no other nation has ever had to fight so hard to survive from the very beginning, from their very birth, almost as if the point was being made. And it was. It really was. Time and again, Israel had to fight to survive against huge odds. How did this tiny nation survive? How is it even possible that so few men and so few people could fight and against such vast numbers consistently? I'm going to come back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 in your Bibles, if you can. The words of Moses. Because as a nation, Israel themselves had done nothing of their own to be special. The Bible is at great pains to point this out for us. Israel is part of God's purpose and they are a witness to his word. In Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy is one of the writings of Moses, the leader of Israel who took the children of Israel out of Egypt under the Exodus. In Deuteronomy 7 we read verse 7. And Moses is addressing the people of Israel. He says, The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other nation. You weren't chosen because you were a great big mighty power and you're the right people to get on side with. You know, it wasn't like people say, Oh, you, you know, you support America because they're so big and so powerful, um, you know, that you, you'd be silly to support the, the underdog. God says, No, I didn't choose you because you were such a, a, a massive amount of people. In fact, he says at the end of verse 7, you were the fewest of all people. So it wasn't about numbers. It wasn't about how big the the nation was. But what does he say in verse 8? But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. That's why God's done what he has. God has done it because he loved them, because he would keep the oath, the promise that he'd made. The promise that God had made to the fathers of Israel, to the original founders of the nation, 
And because God is faithful, he is a God that will keep his word. And he said, under these conditions, I will support you, I will love you, I will look after you. And God was looking for them to return that relationship, to keep his commandments, to listen to his word and to call him their God. It was not because of anything Israel themselves had done. God was willing to guide them. He was willing to bless them if they were his people. And this all started with, as we said here, with the oath, with the promises that God has made. It started with one man, Abraham originally, the father of the Jewish nation. And through his faith, he obtained promises of God. Through his faith in service to God, God indeed blessed him. We pick up some of the words of the words of the promises that was given to Abraham um, in Genesis chapter twelve, verse two and three. God said, "I'll make a great nation of your descendants. I'll bless you, and I'll make your reputation great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I'll curse the one who curses you, and through you." All the people of the earth will be blessed. This is an amazing promise for anybody to receive, especially to receive it from the hand of God. God says, I'll make your, your descendants great. You'll have a great reputation. You will be a blessing. In fact, the whole earth will be blessed because of you. The only problem with that is that it never happened. Abraham's dead, he's gone. His reputation is, is not great. No other nation in the earth would say that they're blessed because of Abraham. I suppose you might find the Arabs saying something along those lines, but not really. <coughs> this promise is still standing to be fulfilled. And God says, because of the promise that I made to the fathers of the nation, he said, that's why I have an interest in Israel. In the next chapter, in chapter 13, again, God said in verse 14 to 17, he said, after Abraham, it was known as Abram at the time, after Lot, his nephew, had left him, God said to him, look off to the north, the south, the east and the west, all points of the compass from where you are living, I'm going to give you and your descendants all of the land that you see forever. So he didn't just say to your descendants, he said to you and your descendants forever. I'll make your descendants as plentiful as the specks of dust in the earth so that if you can count the specks of the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be counted. Get up, rise, walk through the length and breadth of the land because I'm going to give it to you. You know, this area, the north, the south, the east and the west from where Abraham was living, it's, it's almost the complete Middle East area. And so because we know that this isn't fulfilled, we know that Abraham didn't get the land, he never received it according to scripture and he hasn't got it now, we know that there has to be some futuristic applications to this. It has to relate to the future. Because Israel today even is not recognised as a great nation, are they? They're not a great force. They are a force in their own self to be recognised, but they're not a big nation. They're not a a powerhouse in the world economy or the economics of of the politics. And they're not guaranteed the land forever. God says there, I'll give it to your descendants forever. Who can say that Israel will be there forever today? I think they're hanging onto the land carefully sometimes. And so fulfilment of these promises from God requires Israel's change of status. They have to change their status amongst the nations. It means Abraham would have to be resurrected from the dead. He would have to be alive again. It's the only way in which those promises could be fulfilled. And if you, as I said, if you read the account of Abraham's life, it's recorded there that he never received the land. He never received the promise. In fact, when he was given these promises, he had no children yet, and he was an old man. He had no children, and God says, I'll I'll make your your descendants like the dust of the earth. So You can't count them. It seemed impossible that he could have a family that could be so described. But he had faith in God. Because of his faith, 
and his trust that what God said he could do, he would do, God blessed him. That's why God gave him the promises. It was about his faith in God, his trust. God blessed him with a son, Isaac, who in turn had a son, Jacob. And because they also had the faith of God in, uh, to serve God in the same way, they both received the promises from God also. And so that formed this oath that we read about here in Deuteronomy chapter 8 because God had given this oath to the fathers. And then Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, had 12 sons, which were the formation of the nation of Israel, where the 12 tribes branched out. This promise to Abraham is essential. It's not only essential in Scripture, but it's an essential part of Jewish belief. It's, it's part of, of what was taught us by the, uh, by the apostles. And this is what the apostles said about the Lord Jesus, that he actually confirmed the promises, which makes them very important. In Romans 15, verse 8, he says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, and that's an expression for those that are the Jews, they were the circumcised. He was a minister of the Jews. For the truth of God. Why? But he might confirm the promises made unto the fathers. It was all about bringing together the promises. So now we've gone from the very beginning in Deuteronomy where Moses talks to that young nation of Israel about the essential promises of God right through to Christ and where the apostles are saying, well, the purpose of Christ was to fulfil those promises. They are an integral part of the word of God. In fact, they became part of the gospel and that is what really is the gospel that Jesus taught in his ministry. And you might notice that it was all about the faith of the fathers. It was about the faith that they had. It was essential. And so the Lord himself taught this same principle. In fact, he said, I think it's in uh, Matthew Matthew 22, if you're making notes, in Matthew 22, verse 32, he said that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So he quotes the fathers that received the promises. He says, and he is a God of the living, not the God of the dead. Now we do know that those men are dead. And the only way he could say that and mean what he was saying was that they, in God's eyes they will be alive again. They must come alive again. It's the only way in which God could see them as living today when they're not because he can see the day when they will be living and in the earth again to receive the promises that God has made to them. We well, might ask, well, why does God intervene in Israel's existence? And let's go back to Numbers uh, chapter 14. And again, we're looking at an incident with the children of Israel um, in their history, and we, and we get a bit of an insight into why God intervenes in the nation of Israel. Because there were times, of course, many times, when Israel let God down, and he, and he had to intervene. And in Numbers 14, God actually speaks to Moses. He says this in verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long would this people provoke me? How long will it be that they don't believe me? For all the signs which I've showed among them, God had just brought them out of Egypt with all these miraculous plagues, all these signs that proved he was almighty God. And he says, how long will they refuse to look and listen? In verse 12 he says, right, I'll smite them with the pestilence. I'll disinherit them. This is drastic action. He says, and I'll make of you, Moses, a greater nation, a mightier nation than them. God had said, I've had enough. And Moses says, well, then the Egyptians will hear about it. And you've just saved the Israelites out of Egypt. You've just brought them out of their land. And what they'll do in verse 14 is they'll tell the inhabitants of the land that we're going to, the land which would become Israel, for they've heard that you are with the people that you're a God that can be seen and that your power is within, you know, there's a cloud that stands over them. It says in verse 15, now if you kill all these people, then the nations which have heard the fame of you will speak and say, well, it's because he couldn't do it. God didn't have the power. 
You see, Moses was actually hitting on the fact of this is how God does work, doesn't he? He has used Israel to show that he has the miraculous power to work with people. They're an incredible example to the world of how God can work with you if you're willing to be his servants. God was or is known as the God of Israel in the Bible. That's his name. He puts his name to Israel. I am, he says, the God of Israel. He's persevered with them. He's preserved them through history. And he's brought them to this point in history now directly. Let's have a look at our reading, which our chairman read for us, for us of Isaiah 43. There's a little bit more here for us to consider. And this is where we see how God really opens up about his relationship with Israel. It's a unique chapter in regard to that. In Isaiah 43, there's a lot of information here. We're not going to go through it in detail. But let's just have a quick look at some of the key points that are interesting to our subject tonight. In verse 1, God says, Now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. So here's God saying, I'm talking to you, Israel, and I'm your God. In fact, not only am I God, your God, I've created you. I brought you into being from the very beginning. God did the creating. and He uses the term Jacob, which, as I said, Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. And out of Jacob came this nation. He says, I've formed you. The word formed in the Hebrew dictionary there actually means to be put under pressure and shaped. God says, I've shaped you to be the people you are, to be my people. He's done a lot here because it's dear to his heart. These are his people and he's working with them. Let's go down to verse 4. Since thou wast precious in my sight, you've been honoured and I've loved you. I've given men for you and people for your life. God says, you are precious to me. Israel is a precious nation in God's sight and the scriptures bring this forth time and time again. Verse 5 and 6, fear not, he says, for I am with you. I'll bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. And here it is, here's the work of God. He says, I'll regather you from the nations right around the world. I'll always bring you home again. I will say to the north, in verse 6, give up. And to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. God will go to the ends of the earth to bring his people back to the land. And that's exactly what has happened, isn't it? There's part of that prophecy, and there's several others that we'll touch on tonight, that talk about God's hand bringing Israel back into the land. In verse 7, Everyone is called by name, my name. I have created the Jews. I have created these people for my glory. I've formed them. I've made him. God's directly working with these people. It couldn't be much clearer, could it? What about verse 10? God says, you are my witnesses. They're witnesses to God's existence. You're my servant that I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand who I am as a God. Before me there was no God, neither shall there be after me. And really what God was saying, he's really saying to them, you know, Israel's proof that he's the only God because if there was another God, he might stop this from happening. There is no God that can stop it happening because the only God, the God of Israel, is in control. Nobody can challenge him and he has made Israel his people. And the most important thing is that God has taught us through the scriptures that the Jews have everything that we need. They have these promises that God has given them and that through them the nations of the earth will be blessed. This is exactly what the Lord Jesus told um, the woman of Samaria when he met with her. He said this interesting thing about the Samaritans. He said, well, you don't know really what you're worshipping. But we, as in the children of Israel, we know what we worship because salvation is of the Jews. The ability to be saved is directly related to the Jewish nation. The idea of saving people comes out of the gospel message. And the Lord Jesus was teaching very clearly that the Jews have everything that the world needs, not because of their ability, but because of the way in which God works with them. And so there's these remarkable things that indicate very clearly that Israel 
is a special people indeed. They were given special guidelines. They were given laws to serve God correctly, to do that in an acceptable manner. It was made very clear to them that if they failed to serve God, then they could expect to be persecuted and scattered by other nations around the world. And so that's why we see clearly that Israel went out of existence. They stopped being a nation because God fulfilled his word there too. It wasn't unconditional. It wasn't just God would turn a blind eye to everything they did. Look at the words again of Moses in Deuteronomy. And I'm sorry this is a bit wordy, but it, it clearly defines in chapter 28. He says, if you go against God's word, he said, you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. And so it will come to pass that the Lord, as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice to destroy you and to bring you to nothing. You'll be plucked from off the land where you're going to possess it. The Lord will scatter you among all people from the one end of the earth into the other. And that's exactly what has happened. You'll serve other gods, which you or your fathers have not known. And among those nations, you'll find no ease. In fact, he says, you'll have trembling heart, failing of eyes. Your life will hang in doubt. We've only got to look at the events of the Second World War in recent history, really, to see how those words were fulfilled. Yet alone when you go back further in history and see clearly... History has shown us this did happen. God allowed them to be taken into captivity. Initially, they were taken by the Babylonians the first time and their nation had ceased to exist. You know, even then, back then, that would have spelt the end to any other nation, but not to Israel. Because not only had God foretold that there would be these disastrous consequences of their sins, but he also said he would bring them back to the promised land again. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 25. This is really interesting because God, before it happened, God said to them that they would be taken away by the Babylonians. He said exactly how long they'd go into captivity and then he said that they'd come back again. So here's the prophecy of Jeremiah in verse Jeremiah 25 and verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, so there it is, the words of Deuteronomy 28, isn't it? If you don't respond to my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, will bring them against the land, against the inhabitants of Israel, against all those nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, make them an astonishment and an hissing, and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone and the light of the candle, and this land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. It's pretty complete, isn't it? Look what he says then. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So even before Israel was taken by the Babylonians, they knew if they listen to God and if they are prepared to hear his word, that it was for a period of 70 years. Verse 12, it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, then I'll turn against the king of Babylon and the people will come back as a consequence into the land. Isn't it interesting that God has been very clear, very concise on how he deals with Israel? And so eventually they came back into the land and they established themselves again. And while they're in the land, eventually the time came that the Lord Jesus was sent by God to Israel with the gospel message. But again, they rejected him. They crucified him. They said they didn't need the work of God. They said they could do it themselves. They didn't believe that God would work with them. And so God, by the hand of the Roman Empire, again scattered Israel. He allowed them to be persecuted and destroyed. He allowed them to go into captivity once more. And once more, Israel was not a nation. But because of his promise, he wouldn't leave it there and he didn't, did he? 
Look at Jeremiah 30, verse 11. I am with thee, says God, to save thee. And he's talking about Israel. Even though they were no longer a nation and they were to go into captivity, I will save you. Though I might make a full end of all the other nations where you've been scattered, I'm not going to make a full end of Israel. I will correct you in measure. I won't leave you altogether unpunished, but I won't destroy you either. I will save you. And that's God's message to Israel. And so Israel's history is a witness that these words, over 2,500 years ago, they're written about 600 BC, would be fulfilled. And since the Roman Empire took Israel into captivity and dispersed them around the world, every world power that has existed has done its best to exterminate the nation of Israel and totally without success. The saying is that the Jews have remained at the graveside of every persecutor. They've outlived them all. No other nation has suffered as the Jews and been so massively, I was going to say exterminated, but decimated, I guess. No other nation like that has suffered like they have and yet regathered again. And not only regathered, but in the same land, with the same name, nearly 2,000 years later. Because Israel is a witness to a living God. And Israel's miraculous existence is proof that God is giving special help to his promised. Proof to the world that God wants him to notice his hand working in this nation. They may not be serving God. They may not adhere to his word. But God is still working with them according to his promise. Well, we started by outlining Israel's struggle to begin as a nation. But even today, they don't enjoy peace, do they? They don't have peace like we enjoy here. We're not under threat by our neighbours directly. We don't have a border near us where anything, any missile could launch over at any moment. We don't have nations saying that they hate us and want to exterminate Australia. Chinese aren't really looking on us too much favour at the moment, but Hopefully that's not the same. But the Jews are under constant threat, aren't they, every day? Arabs, Palestinians, Lebanese, Iraqis, Iranians, I should say, not Iraqis. It just goes on. Many of them have vowed to push Israel into the sea and destroy the nation. And so knowing what we know from Scripture, what we've looked at briefly tonight, what's God's purpose with Israel? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Uh, Ezekiel was given these um, prophecies concerning the future of Israel. It's a study in itself, and we're not going to try and do that justice tonight. But let's have a look at some of the words of Ezekiel 36. And what God will do in the future with Israel, he says in verse 26 of Ezekiel 36, verse 26. A new heart will I give you, Israel. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away your stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you the heart of flesh. In other words, you will respond. I'll put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. So Israel will be turned to God. It says in verse 28, You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God because that's what God promised to be in the beginning. I'll also save you. I will call you. I'll increase your corn and give you no famine. I'll multiply the fruit of the tree. I'll give you everything. I'll increase your, your bountiful harvest. God is willing and able to look after Israel. But in verse 32, Not for your sakes do I do this, saith the Lord God. I want it to be known to you. It's not for your sakes. It's because God has a purpose with this earth and Israel is a witness to that. You know, God prophesied that Israel was to come back as a nation in chapter 37. Because remember, Ezekiel's prophesying in captivity. Israel no longer exists. Look what God says in chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley that was full of bones. And he caused me to go all around these bones and behold, there were very, very many in this valley. 
They were very dry. They'd been dead a long time. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? God was asking him this question. He said, you know, when you look at this sort of, you have a pitch like this in front of you, can you see life here? And to the normal eye, you can't. But with God, anything is possible. With anything, with God, he can do anything. And God asks Ezekiel this question because he then shows him a vision where the bones come together into skeletons and then the flesh and the, and the muscles come together and then the skin and then eventually they stand up. And, and eventually in verse 10, the breath comes into them and they live and they stood up as an exceeding great army. And God was saying to Ezekiel, and he goes on to explain to him in this chapter, he said, that's what I'm going to do to Israel. You think they're dead and gone? You think that they can't exist anymore? It confounds you that they could even come back to life. He said, but the miracle is I'll make them like an exceeding great army. Ezekiel 37 and verse 21. The Lord said, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the world the nations, whither they be gone, I'll gather them on every side and I'll bring them to their own land. I'll make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And then, he said, I'll give them a king. Something he's yet to do, isn't he? God is yet to give them the king that will reign from the throne of David. Verse 24, David, my servant, shall be king over them. They'll have one shepherd and they will walk in my statutes. They will dwell, in verse 25, in the land that I've given them. And indeed, the purpose of God in the future is to establish the kingdom of Israel through the work of his son, the Lord Jesus, who is appointed as the son of David. It'll be interesting because nobody will oppose the will of God under the hand of Christ. And those that do will suffer the consequences thereof because, of course, the power of God is exceeding. The scripture tells us of the battle of Armageddon, a time in which the world will come against Israel and a time in which the Lord will be revealed as the king of all the earth and he will make Jerusalem the capital of this this world. For the first time, Israel will be, as according to the promises of God, a place of safety. It will dwell in peace. All nations will submit. In Micah chapter 4, we have this. In the last days, the last days of mankind's rule on the earth, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established. It shall be exalted above the hills and people will go to it. They'll flow up to it. All the nations will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, the God of Jacob, because the law will go forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. And God will judge the world and they'll be convinced to turn their weapons of warfare into weapons or into instruments of agriculture. Israel will at last recognise God. They will at last recognise the Lord as their Messiah and they will establish the kingdom of God. In what way does it affect you and I? All this is very interesting. It's great history and it's very interesting how the Bible unfolds. But in the end, if it doesn't affect us, then it's just information. We put it really simply. God's plan is to fill the nation and the world with people who are adopted Israelites, if you like. Other people outside of Israel who have been prepared to come under the promises of the fathers. Those that have embraced the hope of Israel. Those that have understood how God works and have become part of that family of faith that we talked about. The Apostle said in Galatians 3 verse 26, Ye are all the children of God by faith. And of course he's talking to those that are converted, those who have accepted the gospel message, the power of God that is to save through the promises. We're all the children of God if we have that faith that Abraham had the faith that God would provide, the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate seed of Abraham who was Christ. He was literally the seed of Abraham, but he was also the seed of Abraham through faith. And God will make him the ruler of the world from Jerusalem. Come with me to Romans chapter 4. And here's the words that the apostle wrote to the first century believers in the, in the um, city of Rome. Romans chapter 4. Verse 13. 
The promise that he should inherit the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And that's what we've been saying, haven't we? Those promises came because of that belief in God, that faith that God would do what he said, that God will keep his promise absolutely unshakable against all odds. God will do what he said. It wasn't through some law that Abraham believed in, but he had faith in what God told him. Verse 20, Abraham didn't stagger at the promise of God with unbelief, but he was strong in faith. He gave glory to God and he was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was going to perform. And so God imputed it to him for righteousness. God called him righteous because of it. And then he says in verse 23, now that was, that's not recorded, that's not written just, just so Abraham can read it. But for us also in verse 24, to whom it shall be imputed to us, we can have the same thing if we believe on God that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our, our offences and was raised again for our justification. The faith of Abraham is important for us. And if we embrace that, then we too can be of the people of Israel according to God's plan.